All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Conversations with Crystal, a production of Tri-County Media. I'm Crystal, your host, and today we will be talking to Mr. George McKinney, who is the coordinator for, or the emergency management coordinator for Greenwood County. But before we uh, get to him, let me do our Women's History Month quote. It's from an anonymous woman, but for, it means a lot to me. And I think it would resonate with a lot of women as well. And it reads, a strong woman is one who feels deeply and loves fiercely. Her tears flow just as abundantly as her laughter. A strong woman is both soft and powerful. She is both practical and spiritual. A strong woman in her essence is a gift to the world. So to women on this day during Women's History Month, just know if no one has ever told you, you are a gift to our nation, to our world. And I thank you for all that you do for us. All right, let's get started. Mr. McKinney, I want you to uh, talk to our viewers, introduce yourself. I, I am George McKinney. I am the Greenwood County Emergency Management Coordinator. I have been in this position on the 17th of March this month, will be eight years. Uh, I have lived in Greenwood County uh, since I was seven years old. I grew up in the Hodges area. Uh, I have uh, served in the military for eight years, uh, active duty. I served uh, another 19 in the Guard for a total of 27 and retired in 2012. Uh, I have uh, served in different capacities, if you will, at the uh, from an emergency management, homeland security uh, uh, positions, if you will, across the state, both at the state level and at the county level. Uh, and uh, like I say, I've uh, been here for nine years, and uh, this is my first pandemic. As it is everyone's first <laughs> pandemic. Yes. I think the last one was 1812? No, 1918. 1918. I flipped that all. I went back to the war, yeah. didn't I? <laughs> yeah, uh, 1918. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's talk about COVID-19 that just actually became... It shut our nation down a year ago this week. Uh, as far as from a teacher standpoint, I'm an educator. And so from our standpoint, this was the week that we all went home and didn't know when we were going back. So, and we've heard a lot of misinformation in regards to this particular virus. So we heard that it came from China. There were some bats involved. There were some other things going on that people are just, I feel like really confused about. And if possible, could you tell us where specifically did this virus originate from? Well, they do still believe it came from China, but through a bat. Uh, and yeah. uh, that is uh, not unnormal for stuff. Uh, mammals, a bat is a mammal uh, such as us. And so they do have the capability of having viruses that can transfer to humans. Uh, the swine virus or the swine flu that they call is same much as with through pigs and stuff as being a mammal. So there's certain things that can transition over to that. And, and that did start in China. Uh, it, it, it wasn't started on purpose or anything, but it just started through bats in China and made its way out of China across the world. And so it's not unusual to have those types. And I think uh, the SARS virus and uh, others that have, and there's a MERS virus that occurred out of the Middle East. The SARS was out of Southeast Asia, which those were two viruses that are similar to this COVID virus. The SARS one more so than the MERS. Uh, but those also started uh, as a result of uh, a mammal and it transitioned over to a human virus. So, mm -hmm. so those are true statements that they have that it did start from that, that standpoint. Uh, the, uh, the, the challenges with these viruses are is catching them early on, uh, making sure that uh, you're able to uh, restrict movement from those locations where these do occur. And they were very successful in doing that with SARS and with MERS. Uh, however, this one somehow got out and, and spread rapidly uh, across uh, pretty much into Southeast Asia and then into uh, the U.S. fairly quickly and then around the world at that point. Once It's hard. So I'm trying to think it's, uh, it's about like trying to put a cat back in the box. Once it's out, you can't do that. Right. And so uh, that kind of was the transition that we started. And like you say, a year ago this week, it really was in uh, uh, South Carolina had its first cases and it started in Lee County. Unfortunately, it started in a nursing home uh, or a uh, assisted living facility there in Lee. 
uh, County. Uh, that one, uh, that is, a, 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 I would say, the worst place that a virus can be anywhere because it is so easily to transmit that throughout that whole population. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later, and that is the worst population that it, can, it could contract the virus to is those that are elderly <clears throat> because this virus has uh, had a, a big impact on our elderly population across uh, the state and the world, really. Right. It has been really uh, hard hit in those areas uh, for those age groups and stuff. Uh, go ahead. You had a question. Okay, so I was going to ask you, since we were already into the COVID and, and talking about that, how many different strands of COVID are there? Oh, uh, the, the, the common cold. I, I, I don't know the answer to total of that, but I can tell you the common cold is a COVID virus. Okay. So when you get sick uh, with just runny nose and kind of sniffles and maybe a headache, uh, that is a coronavirus. And, and it's based on, the, they call them corona because how the virus is designed. It's not necessarily uh, a, a, a different type of, it's different from the influenza. The influenza virus is a different type of virus than the, uh, the coronavirus. So there are multiple types of coronaviruses out there. Uh, and, and so ones that affect us mainly is the common cold. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, and I'll add this in there, the vaccines of some countries, and in fact, Johnson & Johnson's uh, vaccine uses that coronavirus as a uh, catalyst to come in as part of their vaccine. And so does the, I think it's the Russian and the uh, British that they designed did the same thing. Okay. So it, there's different ones, and then there's variations on those types of uh, viruses too. And, and uh, I'm trying to think the best way to explain that is uh, as, as a virus goes, it, it mutates as it goes. And uh, it, it looks for the best way to infect its host, whether it be us or any other mammal that it is attacking. So as it goes through its processes and the more time it replicates itself, the more chances is it, it mutates and stuff as it goes through, as we've seen here with this virus here. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that. Right. So with it mutating and with the different types of vaccines that we have out there, how are we, the public, assured or can we be assured that it's, go the, it's going to be successful? You mean the vaccine? Right. Uh, yes. Uh, as of right now, there's uh, three viruses, mutations that I know of that are, are, that are out there. There's the uh, South American, uh, the British, and the uh, South African. Uh, and uh, the Brazil, I guess, is out, coming out of South America. Those are the three that are there. Currently, all the vaccines that are out there, and this is based off of uh, both the uh, studies by the uh, companies that made the vaccines as well as other government entities, that they do provide a level of defense against these viruses. Uh, and, and the thing about these uh, vaccines, they don't keep you from getting the virus. What they do is they keep you from being very sick with the virus because what they've done is they've uh, amped up your immune system so that it's better prepared to attack it before it can get to a certain level within your system. So right now, the studies that are being done, and there's still some ongoing studies with each of these uh, vaccines to make sure, and some of them are saying they're gonna do boosters. Uh, but an example here with these are is these vaccines like the, uh, uh, Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Johnson Johnson are in the area of about 90% effective against that initial co uh, COVID. Most influenza viruses are only about 50 to 60% effective. So this this strain, uh, this vaccine is uh, is better. So even if we are only still 50 to 60%, we're still at the same level as the influenza viruses uh, vaccines that are out there as well okay. on that. So, so I, I can't give you a guarantee, but I can uh, tell you that they are working on it and the things that they've been able to find, it has been successful against it. Okay. So with that, um, the vaccines that we have currently out, the three different types, mm -hmm. when 80% of the population has to be vaccinated in order to get a handle on the actual COVID-19, did I hear that? Did I read that right? Or I, it, There's different levels there. Uh, it's anywhere from 70, and I've heard anywhere from 60 to 80 percent. Uh, I would say 80 would be the high end to, to get herd immunity is what you're, you're speaking of. Herd immunity, of. right. 
Yeah, and, and so you get some herd immunity level even with those individuals that get the virus because your your body still and survive. You you your body creates a a level of defense against that even there. Just when you get the vaccine, it increases it. Even if you've had the virus, you should get the vaccine because you'll have a better uh, uh, viral, uh, a ver better immune system against that virus. So, yes, it, it, it takes a while to get to that herd immunity. And so when you look at the total numbers across uh, just the, the state right now, uh, confirmed cases right now are just hit 450,000 confirmed cases in the state. Uh, that doesn't include our vaccination. That's just the confirmed cases that we have. Uh, and that was today, I think it went over 450,500 some odd. And when you look at that, that's not even 10% uh, of the population of South Carolina. We're about 5.2 million. So we still have about 100,000 or a little less than 100,000 to go just to get to that 10% mark. Right. Um, so when we're talking about this vaccination and once people are vaccinated, I read, it came across my phone on my way here that they're saying if people have been vaccinated, it's safe for them to be in different households together. Meaning if I've had my shot, you've had your shot, we can be in the same office together. Is that what you, have you heard that information? Yeah, yes, I have heard that. What, what this will do is it, it helps, uh, like I say, it doesn't keep you from getting it. But what they're looking at is if you have it right now, you have a high probability. And I, I have had my shot about four weeks ago. I finished up my second one. After two weeks, you're at your max of whatever you're going to get out of it, where it's at uh, the 60% or it's at the 90% percentile. Excuse me. And so, yes, I'm hearing that they're opening up and allowing uh, that to go. And, and, and it's kind of getting back to somewhat of a new normal or a different uh, normal, if you will. Uh, they are looking at it. Uh, if you, you still can get it and you can still spread it. But uh, we have focused in South Carolina, and I know that and it's happened across the U.S., on those that are most impacted by this. And there's two things. One is the deaths that occur from this, and the other is the hospitalization. And if you look at the at the death rate, uh, at and I, I know this kind of, I don't want to sound morbid or anything, but most of the deaths, we've had 159 deaths in uh, Greenwood County. 143 of those deaths have occurred individuals that are 61 and older. And so when you think about that, that is, that is an, and, and when you think about the total number, there's only 16, 1700 people that have had that at that age group. And so you're looking at a very high mortality, uh, morbidity rate. And so the other thing that you want to do is you want to keep down the number of people that are in the hospitals. Hospitals, uh, they run at about 75, 80 percent occupancy uh, constantly because they have to make that's where they make their money and stuff and everything. And, and that's rightfully so. But what happens is when you start in, in uh, and most of that money is made off of elected surgeries and different things of that nature out there, not off of people that are in with uh, COVID or uh, the flu even. Uh, so what we try to do is cut down the numbers of people in the hospital. And in Greenwood County in January or right late Feb early February, late January, we hit a high of over 80 people in the hot in, in self regional uh, with COVID. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but they only have 206 beds. So that was almost a 50%. That was really about uh, 38, 40% of their bed capacity. And that really impacts them. The other thing is it, it took up a lot of their, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, critical care beds. And that's the other side of it is that they only have 30 of those. And we were running in the cases of about 15 to 17, so almost over 50% of those beds. So if somebody else needed that, that really impacted them. So what, the, what this vaccine is able to do and what it's doing for us is it's cutting back on the number of people that have to be hospitalized and those that will get it to the level that they may pass away. I'm not going to say you're, you're going to get 100% of that, but you're going to cut back that significantly. And so that's the reason it's very important for us to get the vaccine to everybody and get that 80% or 60 to 80% herd immunity so that we don't over, uh, uh, if you will, run over our hospitals and our health systems are depleted because of that. And it came very close. In fact, uh, several locations across the state had to open up additional areas in order to handle all of those that were sick. 
I'm not certain where all of those are. Self did not have to do that. Thank uh, goodness we were able to keep it fairly, they were able to keep it across here. And it's amazing if you think about it because self services seven counties. They don't just service Greenwood County. And so those 80 were not just out of Greenwood County, those were out of the seven counties around here. So it, it's very uh, good of what, uh, you know, keeping it at that low. Now, it only lasted that way. We're down today. Uh, we have seven uh, in the hospital with COVID, two are in the uh, 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 critical care unit right now. And so that's that's great. I mean, that is, that is great news. I mean, not that <laughs> I'm not saying that anybody in there is not great, but it's, right. it's, it's good news that we're not overtasking our health uh, system right now. Right. So when we're when we're talking about the health system and we're talking about hospitals and people over 61, did any of them were they healthy individuals or did they have underlying health conditions? Is one and, group more susceptible than another group? Yes, and that's one of the things across, now this is across South Carolina. I don't have the numbers for Greenwood County specifically, but when we looked at that, uh, one of the things, the highest uh, level, anybody that had cardiovascular disease, uh, they were like at a 31% uh, potential, 31% uh, of those that passed away had cardiovascular uh, issues or disease. And so that was pretty high. There's a there's a list out there, and I can go through it if you'd like. But there's a list of those different things uh, out there. COPD was the fourth highest, uh, the second highest. And let me check and see what that was here. Was diabetes? <clears throat> diabetes was one of the highest. Was the second highest at 27 percent of those that passed away had diabetes. And there's a list. I can I can provide this. It's on the uh, DHEC website. Uh, and this was updated uh, on the uh, 21st. They do it about once a month. Uh, they will update these numbers. And so right now, this is based off of the 21st of February. So it's a little little dated, but it's still the most recent uh, data that we have. And so with that, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, COPD, how do um, different ethnic groups fare with COVID? I had heard sometime early year that African-American mortality went down due yes, to... and it is. They're, right now, about 33% of those that have passed away in uh, Greenwood County were uh, uh, African-American. Uh, 60, the other 60 so percent are either white or of another nationality. There's 60.3, I think, is, is, the, uh, is white, and then the other is about 9% or something like that in there. So. Okay, so why can do you know why that is? Is it lack of health care? Is it does the vaccine? I don't know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, how, I, how I, would you? It, why it, would it, it be it, so it, high in one group or not the other? Or and here's one of the things to think about too: is it's not necessarily uh, the health of uh, well, it is the health of the individuals, but it's the lifestyles too. And, and I'm not saying anything care. negative here, but that we all have different lifestyles that we live. And so some of it is that there's availability of stuff. I'm not saying health care so much, but it might have been mask alone. It might yeah. have been also how, how many people have to live, not just a single family in a place, but multiple families that have to go different places. So those are some of the things that come into it. It's not necessarily a, a racial Type in, in sense of or, or that it may be just how you you have to live, and so that's some of the things that I'm sure will come out of this. And, and we talked a little bit about the uh, uh, pandemic of 1918, and there's been great studies on there. There's numerous books that go back and do a lots of these studies. It's hard to get a lots of that good information. You can get some general information right now, but I don't want to say uh, just having a year to look at it is uh, not good, but uh, it takes a while longer to, to really dig into what was the real cause and why was this versus this or whatever it may be. And so I think it, it's partly lifestyle. I think it may be to some degree, it could be uh, uh, the availability of health care because these individuals may not have had the availability beforehand for that. It could be your diet too, and the diet that you live based on, uh, I know different uh, people have to live different ways based on what they can afford. And some of those are may cause these things such as diabetes or cardiovascular uh, disease, and that could increase those numbers. 
And, and I think when you look at across the board right now, uh, it, it is, I, I don't want to say, I think we're 24% right now in Greenwood County is about the population split there. And so when you look at 33 versus 24, yes, a little high versus, you know, 60 or something of there. But I, you know, it, once again, it could be purely because of the lifestyle that they've had to live and has led to that. Right. Okay, that's, that's good information. Um, Dr. Fauci has said recently that with the relaxing of the different restrictions that we have, that we're getting ready to go to that new normal, um, that he is cautioning us that if we do it too quickly, we're looking at a fourth wave of COVID cases. What could you tell our listeners to do so that we in the upstate don't have an onset or higher numbers here in Greenwood County and surrounding counties? We still need to uh, social distance. Uh, we need to wear masks when we're in with other individuals. I mean, you know, we say, and I would tell you, social distancing is probably, uh, and, and I'm not a doctor here, but I did ask one, I said, what is more important, social distancing or wearing a mask? And he said, social distancing. If you can stay away from somebody six feet or more, the likelihood of you getting this uh, disease is very slim. Uh, it, you know, it, it's uh, not, it, it stays out on hard services for about three days. So what we need to do is we need to continue on what we've been doing. If you, if you're out and you're in, you have to get within six feet of someone and have to do your work and stuff like that, wear a mask. If you're, you know, if you're in public uh, locations, wear a mask. Uh, that's going to help. Uh, I would encourage you also uh, to social distance. Uh, like I say, I, I if I can stand six feet away, I stand six feet away. And if I can stand 12 feet away and we can still talk, I still stand 12 feet away. I mean, and I've had my vaccine. And, and it's not so much that I, I'm worried. I'm, I'm getting close to that 61 age group. So uh, I, I, I'm, I turn 60 next year. But I still look at it is it's not so much about me. It's about if I get it, how much how am I going to spread that? So my bigger concern here is how do I not get it in order to uh, reduce the amount that it is being spread. Washing your hands and cleaning uh, uh, sufficiently at home or things that you uh, feel that need to be cleaned with disinfectant, uh, those are the biggest things that we can do. And, and I'll tell you, it's very interesting. Uh, the, the flu this year has been non-existent, and, and I'm not saying it's totally non-existent. Right. It's been very small. I know, I, and I'm trying to think, I think back in December, I, I saw that we did have a death in, uh, down in the lower part of the state from an individual with the flu. It was an elderly person. Uh, but uh, it, was, uh, it's, it, it has not been anywhere near what we, we've had in the past. And Could I think it's that a lot COVID of COVID is overshadowing it. Could that be? I don't think COVID is overshadowing it. Uh, I'll tell you, I, I thought I had COVID a couple of times and I've been tested and I went through. I actually had a sinus and felt fatigued. And I said, oh, I know I've got COVID. So I went to the doctor and they tested me for COVID. No, they tested me for the flu and no. So it's still being tested for and looked for, but we are having a very uh, mild one. And that's good uh, mm -hmm. in that. But I think part of it is because Number one, we're social distancing, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're wearing our face masks and stuff of that nature. Uh, th there are some drawbacks to that, that in the longer term. Uh, our body is designed to defend us against certain things. Uh, and if we, and the way we do that is getting it in small amounts, and I'm not saying we need to get COVID in small amounts or anything like that, but there are certain viruses out there that aren't going to kill us, but they will make us sick. They'll get us mm -hmm. colds or stuff like that. Uh, I, I think the potential there on the backside of this is because we have protected our bodies so much from that, we're going to come out and we're, we'll have that potential for having a, lot, a few more colds or stuff of that nature as we come out of this. Now, when we come out of that, that's, that's going to be the question. I don't know. It might be later this year. It might be early next year. Uh, but normally, and what, what has been seen, and it's in 1918 is a very good uh, indication of the virus, the influenza there. It came through in two waves. Now, we as a, uh, we as a society are totally different than 1918. Right. The, only, the only big thing that was going on in 1918 was the uh, First World War, World War. And there was a lots of travel and trans, uh, you know, movement of people at that time from different culture, uh, countries and stuff. So there was a higher potential for it to spread. Nowadays, I mean, you can jump on a plane and be in 
uh, England tomorrow night if you really want to. Right. And so we're, we're get there. So the thing that we need to look at is still wash your hands, wear masks, stay six feet apart, and make sure you're cleaning as, and being uh, efficient in doing those things. So N95 mask, if, if that's available. But I heard something about double mask. Is that? Yes, uh, and, and there's people... some still, N95 is, is good, but, you know, the thing that you're wearing, that will protect, really what you're protecting against is your virus going out of you. That is what you're really protecting against. You're not protecting about getting it in. N95s, uh, unless they're fitted properly, are no better than the cloth mask that you, you can make and use there. And I would tell you, it, it's cheaper to do that, uh, to make those cloth masks. I know Fauci said that. There's been a study done in Japan uh, recently that I read that said it wasn't as effective as most people thought. Uh, roughly what they're saying is if you're wearing a mask, you improve yourself uh, by 60%. Uh, if you wear one mask. They said if you wear two masks, I think when I read the Japanese, they said you're, you're improving yourself by about 68%. So you're only grabbing another 8%. And, and so it's not, I'm not saying don't double mask if you feel you need to. I'm just saying it, it is not going to double your capability. Right. Uh, because the masks that we wear uh, are not form-fitted. And you can get a form-fitted mask, but uh, that really... Uh, it, you're going to you're going to know it and trying to wear that 24 or out a lot you're going to know it if you're walking or running or doing any of that it's going to really cut back on your ability to really breathe well and stuff now, and so you said about walking and running if you're out running with a partner or exercising should you wear your mask if you're just I, out i would recognize air? i would recommend not stay six feet apart Right. I mean, if I'm out running with a partner, I'm gonna put him six feet behind me because then I'm not, <laughs> I'm not catching. No, I'm just kidding. But you know, anywhere you put six feet up between you, you're gonna be better off. And and I would say if you're exercising now, if you're out walking, same thing. Uh, just stay six feet apart and let you have, you know, if you're in the same household or something of that nature, that's fine. But still, just social distance. That, that's what I would say. Right. So when we have our face mask, and some people just simply have a face cover. Mm -hmm. which would be, does the material matter of what these coverings are made out of? Is one material better than the other? A cloth mask is better. Uh, I know I wear a gaiter, and, and lots of people say, well, well, if you double up the gaiter, you're getting uh, close to the same thing as a cloth mask. Biggest thing, once again, is keeping that out. And, and I would not say that you, uh, uh, I haven't really done the studies on what the difference is, uh, but DHEC recommends that if you wear a, a gaiter, you know, that's a little pullover that goes around your neck and stuff, double it up. And that's what I do. I mean, I like it better because it's easier to handle. I don't have to try to find a place to put the mask constantly whenever I have to do stuff and I'm out of that area. Uh, the, the other thing is face shields. And there are some people that cannot wear masks uh, for mental reasons or medical reasons or things of that nature. Face shields are somewhat effective, but you need one that covers from around the side and down way below, uh, down on your neck. And, and you're still gonna push stuff out. You still push stuff out whenever you uh, breathe, but what it's doing is it's dispersing it away from whomever you're talking to or there. Uh, there uh, there's other places, and you're a teacher too, and I, I'll be honest, I, I have a hearing uh, uh, disorder. Uh, so uh, when I, I don't have hearing, I don't wear hearing aids a lot. Uh, because of my job in places. And so whenever I'm trying to talk to somebody with a mask on, I've learned how to read lips. And so it's become a very challenge for me exactly. as we go forward. And I'm sure there's children that have some of those challenges too. And so as a, I'm sure as an educator, there's some challenges that you've run into uh, in being able to teach. And, and that's some concerns that I've had when we went to the mask and not that I, I don't want people to wear masks, it's just a concern is how do we make sure we're reaching out to these individuals and children especially because some children you don't know are reading lips and stuff right. and so that's that's a hard process but hopefully that this has helped <laughs> identify some of that too because well, the children are asking you, more questions mm -hmm. i agree reading lips i never i didn't realize how much i did that with my students until this yeah. and yeah. my students don't have a hard time hearing me because i'm loud so with my mask, maybe it's easier on their ears. Um, <laughs> however, I do have a hard time hearing them. Uh, and typically I still have to lean in close to them to hear what they're saying. So 
it's it has its drawbacks. But if I'm gonna stay safe and not have COVID, I would rather just wear the mask. Now, let me ask you, since we're talking about the school systems, we have shields around our students. Mm -hmm. If they have that shield around them, do they still need to wear their mask behind that shield? I, and that's up to the uh, school district. I would say yes, uh, and, and here's why, because it, the shield just keeps it from going straight over. You may hit it, but it's still going to go out and stuff, and so it still, it still goes. So the more you put something over your face, and, and children are, believe it or not, uh, I think there's only been less than 400 cases of children under the age of 10 uh, are 10 and under, as well as when you get into those that are uh, under 20, and that goes from 11 to 20 at that point in time, you still had under a thousand, well, a little bit over a thousand, I'm saying under 2,000 individuals that have had COVID testing positive or probable. And But those are the individuals that are most likely to spread it because they have the least uh, symptoms of it. They can be asymptomatic totally, and, and that's where you get in. And that's the reason I would encourage them still to to wear masks, but it's up to your school districts and stuff of how that, that goes right. and stuff. Right. So with that, with students being asymptomatic, teachers are just now able to get vaccinations. We're in the 1B group, along with individuals as 70 and older. Is that mm -hmm. the criteria? To 55 be the, and older. 55 and older. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, when are they going to, are they going to offer this vaccination to children? Uh, not under the age of 16 that I have seen. Uh, 16 and over is what they're looking at. And I don't know, I'm not sure why that is. I have not studied up on that. I haven't got that far into it yet. Uh, but one of the things that uh, is critical in that is that as it opens up and, and individuals are, we're, it's, it's important that everybody that can get it, get it. And and like you say, we're talking that 70 to 60 to 80 uh, percent uh, herd immunity side of the house. So, yeah, I don't know that they will give it to children. But if they're asymptomatic mm -hmm. and we don't know, they don't know they have it mm -hmm. and they can spread it to family members and to classmates, mm -hmm. kind of, I don't know how I feel about that. Well, and, and I don't know if it's because of the shot itself. It may not be, uh, uh, children may not react to it very well. I don't know. And, and that's, that's a good question I don't have the answer to, but I will so, look that up. And we see, don't know if I, students, children haven't been in the study that they did for the shots, correct? There have been no I, children. I don't know. I, I don't know okay. the answer to that. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll have to have to look that up then. That's, yeah, that's, that, that's an interesting question. Um, all right. So let's talk about the various side effects. What are the side effects that people have been experiencing with the COVID vaccination so far? I've heard of flu-like symptoms, cold chills from the first shot, and then, but I recently heard something about a rash. Um, I have not heard anything about a rash. Uh, okay. And uh, what I have heard uh, is that the, the first and foremost thing that had had occurred was uh, anaphylactic shock that was a reaction to it. And that's the reason when you get your shot, you're sitting there for 15 minutes or more, letting them look at you and make sure you don't go into anaphylactic shock. Uh, to my knowledge, and this is me speaking, there's been no one in Greenwood County that has reacted that way, to my knowledge. Uh, that's the Pfizer and the Moderna. Uh, they're pretty close. Uh, I've heard there's a little bit more with the Moderna. Uh, more people are having it. I know my mom had it. Uh, she had a little reaction to it. Like you said, flu kind of symptoms, uh, uh, tired, achy, uh, ran us real uh, small fever, you know, 99 point something or another, uh, and uh, just just didn't feel right, if you will. But that was only for about 24 hours. Uh, she took uh, a leave or uh, uh, what is it, Tylenol or aspirin with it, and she felt better. Uh, she got better fairly quick. My uncle was the same way. My aunt, she had none. Uh, my boss and uh, another friend of mine, they had, that was with the Moderna. Uh, with the Pfizer, I had it. I got a little achy and a little, uh, I didn't get a fever, but I did get achy and tired, lethargic uh, for uh, a day, uh, but it wasn't any anything real bad. It's, I, I kind of liken it to when I have the flu shot. And every time I have the flu shot, I kind of get a little, hmm, out of it and i kind of felt that way maybe a little bit more with this uh in, in that sense 
but those are really the biggest things that you're going to see. I have not heard anything about a rash uh, coming out. Uh, I will look into that as well. Uh, but it, I wouldn't say it's not uh, possible. It's just I haven't heard about that. So each particular shot, whether it's Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson, you can have possible uh, flu-like symptoms or Side so it doesn't matter Correct. which. I will tell you that Johnson Johnson, I have not heard. I've heard that you have some small side effects like that because, once again, it is using a virus. It's not a live virus, but it is still a virus, and your body's going to react because it is the common cold. So you could have those common cold type uh, uh, symptoms, if you will, too, from that. So, but that's, uh, I think this week is the first week that we've got the Johnson and Johnson in South Carolina. Uh, I don't know that they've given any. I haven't talked to DHEC or seen any of that yet. I know the Pfizer and the Moderna are the majority of what we, uh, I would say that's 100% of what has been put out that I know of uh, prior to starting today. And uh, both of them have been, like I say, uh, very minimal issues with it. I have not heard of any major issues across the state or in there, or even in Greenwood County of anybody having issues with it that way. Is there anyone who should not take this vaccination? Other there is a, uh, and I'm not going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preference this with there are certain individuals that shouldn't, and I think it's individuals that are pregnant, uh, and I would have to, well, I, before I say any of that, I'm not certain right now. I know there is a list out there. I don't have it in front of me right now to say that. So before I say yes, pregnant people, so I don't want to say anything that is wrong. And so what I'll just leave it. autoimmune diseases? Would they... Should they no, take uh, my mom has uh, 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 those issues and she took them and the doctor said, please take it. Her okay. doctor encouraged her to do so that. So you would so recommend I, talking to your doctor most definitely before? Yes, before you, before you take any vaccine, I, I would talk to my doctor and stuff. I did with mine and I mean, I don't have any issues or anything, but I still talk to her and, and just, it's, it's smart to get that uh, uh, guidance from them. I will tell you one of the interesting things, though, that is these two, uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer, are both R -M -R uh, mRNA vi uh, vaccines, and which means they do not uh, actually have any type of virus in there. They affect your RNA. And what it does is it just tells your uh, body that, hey, you've got something that is very similar to COVID. You've got COVID coming in, and it causes you to uh, RNA to change and develop those T cells that you need to do. Uh, I was somewhat skeptical when I first heard about that, but luckily Greenwood County has one of the foremost genetic centers in, in the world. And so there's a doctor there that did a very good uh, uh, briefing on those two virus, uh, those two uh, vaccines. And I listened to it and it, it was very good. And, and one of the questions, he spoke to our Rotary Club, and one of the questions was, he said, which one would you take? Mm -hmm. He said, any of them that they will provide me. <laughs> he didn't mm -hmm. have a, he said, any of, even the Johnson and Johnson at the time, Johnson and Johnson wasn't out there, but the British uh, Russian one was out there. He said he would take any of them at that point in time because of that. But the, R, the mRNA, and, and I can send you a link, I'll send it to Tremaine, so that if you want to add that to this, uh, he has a YouTube video out there that talks about this, and you can uh, share that with him too, because it's a very mm -hmm. good, very good uh, uh briefing and stuff on it. Are other countries, do you, are you aware if other countries are still struggling like we are in the United States with COVID? Are, are their numbers down or our numbers higher or are you? Well, I would tell you, I think it's pretty, uh, it's, it, it's different from uh, place to place. And, and it's, and here's why, and it's not so much now, but I'll talk a little bit about 1918. You see spikes that go up and down and we had one in July, August, and now we've had one in January, February, and it goes around that way that you have the, that the virus has come around. And so to say that one country is having more than the others or whatever, it may be more an issue of their health uh, system that's in place there that could have problems than it is that the virus itself is worse in certain places. I, as far as what I've seen, uh, Yes, we've had, I think, uh, uh, somewhere, I, I can't even remember the numbers now. Uh, I've been focused so much on Greenwood County and the state. Uh, but, uh, you know, the U.S. has uh, done fairly good. I mean, once again, whether you get herd immunity to straight through the vaccine or through, through the virus itself, you're going to have to get it. And so 
I will I will relate something to you with the influenza virus that came through in 1918, the two two waves that came through. That it mutated uh, on the second time around. People would get sick in the morning and die in the afternoon. That's how bad that virus was. And I'm not trying to put this virus any smaller or anything, but it was that deadly of a virus. I'm not saying I want anybody to die, and I know we've had quite a million, uh, over a million people, but that, that virus killed between 50 and 100 million people worldwide. And uh, we, we have not even began to approach those numbers, and thank God for that. And I think it's our health system is a little bit better too, but with the rapid movements that we have nowadays, I was more concerned that we were gonna have a, a huge number more so, and that was, you know, I'm not a not a doctor, uh, but I was just reading the history and seeing how those things go. I was really concerned about uh, this virus when it came out. And I'm still concerned, and I still want people to get over it, but it hasn't been as bad as it could be, and and that, I thank God for that. Us still wearing masks, possibly in 2022. Yes, yeah, so it could be, and and that's that's hard to say, and. Here's the thing about it is this virus hits in places and you have difference. Uh, that I like to say this, there's no two counties in, in South Carolina that are the same. And how it, how it functions in one county is not necessarily the same in the other. And so when, when we look at that, uh, I don't know, uh, I, I think people will be wearing masks in 2022 and I think it will be part of the process of still getting out of this. I don't know that, like, uh, I don't know that it's going to be, in a sense, as mandatory as it, it needed, or as, let me put it this way, it's not going to be as needed, I don't believe, in 2022 as it is still today. I think we're slowly moving out of that. I'm sorry. Huh? Is Go the ahead. CDC still recommending businesses have mandates about masks in their... Stores. Yeah, there's still the guidance is still that you should, if you've got uh, individuals in there, you should still uh, social distance, you should still wear masks, and that's the guidance that's out by the CDC. Yes. Okay. What about our homeless population, our inmates, those in shelters, and our mentally ill patients? Yeah. How are they getting these vaccinations? And, and that is uh, ongoing right now. In fact, uh, the the homeless is a challenge, and. Uh, once again, the vaccines are, uh, you know, you can choose to have it or not. It's not mandatory. So uh, we have individuals that do go and work with them uh, from uh, different organizations, and they do ask those questions, and they're now available for those individuals to get it. The question and the concern and how do we get it, I would say there's a, they, they fall in with homebound patients at right now, too. Uh, we have lots of homebound patients that are over the age of 70 that still have not gotten their shots. And it's because we don't have a way to get that to them in lots of cases yet. And so DHEC is still working on that. Uh, it is uh, one of my concerns is, you know, there's a lots of people that, uh, well, I won't say a lot. There's some people that have the ability to have a health, home health care uh, provider, and there's some that aren't. My concern is those that don't have that. How do we con connect with those? Because those are the ones that are going to, if you will, uh, slip through our fingers as far as being able to give that op uh, opportunity. Uh, so we're, we're working with DHEC now to try to come up with that. The homeless, I know right now, uh, Pathway House in Greenwood, uh, they're working with their individuals and working with the homeless as they come in uh, to get them vaccinated. And they are eligible, but we once again have to sign them up right now. And so what they're doing is they're taking their names, is my understanding, to be able to help them do that. Uh, it's going to be a while. I mean, when you look at, uh, I looked at the uh, DHEC's numbers, what they estimate for this 1B uh, group is about 2.7 million people. Out of, that's over 50% of the state of South Carolina. So it's going to be a while to be able to get all of those individuals uh, vaccinated. I don't know that we're going to get a uh, even we won't get 100 percent because there's uh, we're, we're not even getting 100 percent of everybody taking it right now. In fact, there's some and uh, I hate to say it. What I've seen is uh, around the 35 and below uh, they're they're at about 30 percent of taking it. So and I think that might change as we go through and they see more. I'm not certain. And I looked at that as one of the things when I looked at our numbers, when you look at those numbers there, those are probably uh, 35 and below. Well, really 40 and below are probably about 
or better of the individuals that have had COVID and con confirmed and I, that I know of. Well, no, that's probable and confirmed in, in Greenwood County. So the concern here is, is I think when, but when you look at the numbers that have died in that, out of that age group, only two individuals have died. So when you start looking at those numbers, the lowest number that we, the youngest person that has passed away in Greenwood County is 36. Uh, our median age, which is, uh, you know, in there, not the average, but the median age is 81 years old. And the average age is 78.43. So when you look at it, it really affected uh, uh, the, the older population where who had a very small percentage of the uh, virus. Whereas, and, and I think that has skewed some of the individuals say, well, now if I get it, it you know, I'm not going to, you know, it's not going to be any more than the flu, you know, is what they're thinking. And so I think that's some of the concern that I have is how do we, how do we get these individuals to understand that, hey, you still have the potential to give it to other people, even at that age. And there's still some people that have comorbidities that are under that age that may not have had it, that have stayed home. I'm sure you've had some that in your classrooms that have chosen to still video teleconference or something through that process. And so those are the ones that we kind of got to watch out for now, not just the elderly now, but those that are on the comorbidity that are younger that we've got to start looking at. And that's what I, I try to tell those that say, well, I'm not really think I need to get it. And I'm like, you know, I'm not trying to force you to get it, but I say, here, think of this, just because you're under the age of 30 or under the age of 40 and it doesn't impact you significantly, you personally, it could impact those that do have those comorbidities. What about, I think some people are afraid of five years from now what could happen because they had this particular shot or vaccination. Yep. So are we, do we know the long term of the shot? Are they looking, and I don't, I'm sure we don't, um, but I think people are afraid of, when you look at the Tuskegee type deals, they, they, are, they are afraid of what could happen in the future. Is there any way to, pe pe to put people's minds at ease um, I mean, it, it's kind of, I don't know how to ease someone's mind that's concerned that far, because I can't tell you now what is or not going to happen five years, one year, even one week down the road, what's going to happen. Uh, you know, when I took it, I looked at it and I said, right now there's been a test study. We've had X number of people that have had it and nobody has passed away, but I have seen all of these people that have gotten it, have gotten COVID that have passed away. And so that was my my take on it. What what's going to happen in five years? Yes, am I really concerned about it? No, because this this vaccine, it is not it is a new vaccine, but it's not new in how it's been used. Uh, cancer patients have been getting and they've been using our mRNA vaccines on cancer patients and stuff for a while, and I would say for the last five or uh, six years. And so there's some things that have been learned about that through that process that, but once again, they haven't vaccinated on the large scale that they have here. And the question I would still ask is how successful were those? Uh, how long was the study? How long did that person that had cancer live past once they had it? So there's some things that are still out there. And the, the geneticist that uh, we talked to said, we don't know yet. And there will be some studies and we will see this as we go forward, but they're looking at it and have not seen any issues so far with those that they have used this on before to focus on. So. Okay. So I think finally what, and I'm not sure this is a question you'll be able to answer, mm -hmm. but what do you think the possible timeline for reconstructing our nation after this pandemic would be? And when you say re re uh, like getting us back to normal, what would be the timeline? Do you think it's going to last to 2022? Do you think what, and what will our, will our normal be the normal before the pandemic or will we have a new normal? Well, and, and, and that's hard to say. I think from a, a general standpoint, I think we'll go back to somewhat of a normal. I think the problem you'll, the thing that you'll see is we learn and I, I don't know what the, and let me, let me preference it like this. In 1918, after that uh, virus came through and wiped out uh, half towns and stuff like that, there was changes. 
I mean, people were more afraid of uh, strangers coming into their town. So there is going to be a change into the normal, if you will. Uh, however, we we lived past that, and we got back to a, a, a more normal of what we had before that. And right. so I think there is going to be a new normal, but is it going to be something that is mandated? I think it's more going to be us as individuals and us as communities that will look at changing that normal and, and how we deal with things. I don't know that it will be uh, to the point that, you know, I, I look to be able to be able to go back to football games. I love going to the Clemson <laughs> football games and stuff. So I want to go back. I, I think that'll be normal, but will it be exactly the same? I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how Clemson and other individuals deal with that, but I hope it's very close to what we used to have. And I right. think there'll be some that will decide on their own that that normal is going to change in how they deal with, you know, life as a whole. So it, it's, you know, one of the things that's interesting is what is the mental impact this is going to have on people? And and I don't say necessarily in a negative sense on the middle, but what will they? How will they change their behavior? I mean, some people may say, "Hey, I've been," you know, they may look at it as, "Hey, I made it through the COVID, and I've been living my life too safe." And in, in a sense, you know, they were closed back and stuff. Now I want to get out and actually see the world. But there may be some that have said, "Hey, well, I was way out there now," and I think it's going to be based on their own. Uh, situations and stuff. So I don't know that uh, I don't know that we as a government or anything need to change, make those necessarily changes. I think we as a community and a society will do that ourselves. And if there is any new norm, I think you may see some stores still having masks into 2022 for certain. They may say, hey, this becomes a norm for us. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And there'll be people that want to uh, do that. So it, the, the U.S. is great in that sense. It allows us to be ourselves to a degree without da endangering others. And once we get past this, I think there will be some changes and some thoughts on how we do things. So to answer your question, I hope that was not too far around the world <laughs> there, but <laughs> no, I think it, it, there will be a new normal, but it, I don't know that it's going to be normal, the same new normal for everybody, I guess. Right. So everybody will have to decide for themselves how they will adjust to living through this particular pandemic. Yes. And so that, that's good information. Well, I want to thank you for um, coming on and talking with us and having a conversation with Crystal today. I also want to go back. I did not thank you for your service to our nation oh, um, through your you. service of 27 years in the military. So I do appreciate um, you doing that. Um, in six to eight months, would it be possible for you to come back and have another conversation with us? Sure. Possible yeah, that'd be great. Where our nation is and Greenwood County is so that hopefully we can um, dispel any other myths that may arise or give people new information that, sure. because um, I think the I way do. you explained it was very good for people to understand. It was not too technical. So we can we can understand what what's going on in our surrounding counties. Okay. For having me and thanks for letting uh, for what you do too because you get the word out to people and that's the most important thing we can do is communicate. So right, communication is key. That's why we wanted you on to make sure that everybody can hear what's going on because sometimes we hear CNN and some of these other news outlets and it's a little bit over our heads. And it doesn't relate or, or it's not us, it's not our community. So we need right. to know what's going on at home. So um, I thank you for that. I appreciate it. Job well done. Thank you. Y'all, thank thanks for having me. And anytime, just let me know. All right. Thank you. You have a good evening.